Welcome everyone for you having the sixth panel of a series of 12 that we're doing with some of the world's most influential people in the accounting world. We have some leaders of accounting networks, communities, associations that we're talking about what's happening in these interesting times. So we have a super panel today and I'm thrilled to introduce Stephen, Kevin and Gordon. They're going to do a little introduction in a minute. We're going to talk through some of the challenges, opportunities, uh, and uh, what's going on in leadership with the accounting world right now in COVID time. So, Steve, I'm going to start with you. Do you want to give us a little introduction and then we'll move to Kevin and then Gordon? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Delighted to be here. My name is Steve Heathcote. I'm Chief Executive of the Accounting Association Prime Global, which is a, a top five uh, association. We have around um, 300 members worldwide, very diverse uh, small, medium, large firms, lots of different geographies, but basically firms coming together to help each other succeed. Uh, a bit about me, I've been involved in the accounting profession for around 30 years now, so it's a, lot, a long time. You look um, younger, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good profession to be in. Uh, and a lot different roles, um, uh, being a, an accountant myself, a professional accountant, as well as working in membership um, associations as well. Very passionate about the profession, needed more than ever it's all about helping with economic growth helping businesses grow so delighted to be here with the other panelists thanks Stephen. you bring up an interesting point already that the profession at a time like this needs strong leadership strong visionaries to guide us through these uncertain times and we will touch on some of those kevin great to have you with us please give us a quick introduction thank you rob uh, very a great pleasure to be here as well so my introduction won't take quite as long my association with the accounting prof profession is has been nothing like as long as steve's but so I'm the chief executive of Nexu International. I've been doing this job now for, I just think this one about 10 and a half years, so a long time. Before that, I was executive director of DFK International. So of course, Nexu International being a network, the ninth largest network in the world. Um, DFK International is an association. So I've got a pretty good understanding of the challenges of both a network and association. Um, and in terms of my background, well, you may, you probably won't know, but most of my working life I spent in the army. And interesting enough, I've often found that the skills and the experiences I've gained and had in the army have been very useful and, and beneficial. That is particularly the case at the moment. Maybe we'll have a chance to broaden that, uh, that discussion later. But great to be here and always very happy and very pleased to exchange views and be open with other colleagues. Super, thank you, Kevin. And I often wonder, uh, we both know Tim Wilson, who has an army background as well. Is it easier to lead a, a, a network association of accounting managing partners or a platoon of uh, sergeants and recruits in the army? Well, do you want to ask for that now? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're talking about how long we've been in the game, Gordon, you might be able to pip us because although you look pretty young too, you've been doing this for quite a while. So a quick introduction from you. Oh, you just muted Gordon, so uh, just watch that. There we go. There we go. Got it. Need to remember to switch my mute off. Thank <laughs> you for that. Um, so, yes, it's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to pip you or not. Um, so, I uh, failed accountant, I think would be a fair, fair summary, and left Grant Thornton 30 years ago to help accountancy firms with uh, practice development. I called it marketing, but that was not allowed in those days. So. And my first client was, in fact, Grant Thornton. But we've come a long way since then. Uh, 2020 is what we're known as today. And it, certainly in my space, I still work with accounting firms almost every day, trying to work out what's going on, how I can help. And I think over time, we've positioned ourselves quite inadvertently, uh, quite by luck, as being um, arguably the accountant's most critical friend. So I will tell someone if I think they're doing it well, and I will... I have no shame in saying, I don't think this is the right thing to do. And here are some thoughts as to how you might go in a different path. So we've got, um, just to give you some ballpark, we've got a membership organization, primarily the UK and Ireland, but it does extend internationally. We have international associations as members as well. Um, all in, probably about 1,300 firms. A lot of firms are big firms, so they count, you know, Haynes Watts is one firm or more Stevens is one firm, so probably a bit misleading. And then we have about six or 7,000 accounting firms that come to conferences or buy the odd thing or two from us or the odd webinar. So uh, in my travels, I hope that I can, never my ideas, of course, they're always somebody else's ideas. 
Uh, so my job is to say, oh, I think I met someone with that who's had that problem before. This is what they did to fix it. Um, so I think the age old scenario about a consultant is if you give me your watch, I'll tell you the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, so that's what we do. And then behind that, we've then built CPD online. And, and I think now we're very positioned now as a digital training and support is where we're, that's our space. So, you know, COVID-19 has brought on all sorts of changes and accelerated all sorts of decisions that were in the making anyway, by and large, but it's just all brought it to a head. Uh, I'm sure we'll come up uh, some specific examples of that as we chat through, but that's, yeah. that's my, that's my background. Smashing. Thank you, Gordon. And welcome gentlemen, one and all. Let's kick off with, we are in unusual times. There's never been anything like this. And I'm intrigued to know your views. And I'll start with you, Steve, on this, on how the accounting world is coping generally. Traditionally, accountants have, have undergone change through duress. They like heritage. They like certainty. But we are in very uncertain times. So what have you seen about firms dealing with change and how are they coping generally, in your view? Uh, yeah, thanks, Robert. And we are going through different stages of this crisis. I mean, I think in terms of the initial reaction, the profession overall i think pretty much across the board has responded very very well um because the, the the accounting firms have had to make sure that they've looked after their their own teams and they've looked after their clients as well and i think we'll all have stories we can tell about how effectively they've done that with very very short you know time periods we've had firms with employing over well over a thousand people going totally remote within 24 hours and broadly, that's been successful. There's been some lessons learned around that. But um, the message going out to those teams has always been, you know, we, we put your health first. Uh, and that they've been living that in terms of their actions. And then the focus on the clients is coming through very strongly. I think, again, this will be pretty universal. Most firms have put together a task force to, fo to focus on their client needs. They've brought the right expertise together. They're putting a lot of, they're, they're talk talking to their clients. I think one of the, things uh, many of the prime global firms were, were doing very early on was just getting on the phone mm -hmm. um, to clients and talking to them and and although you know that they may not have been able to help particularly at that point just actually helping someone who's in a business who's just been hit by something quite extraordinary helping them understand they're not on their own and other people are going through this it can be very very reassuring um, yeah. to them and of course opens up the line of communication so i think all of those immediate responses have been very strong there's been learning in that you know there are gaps in some of the firms in terms of the um, infrastructure even how they're managing the practices um, but in a way that the learning that's coming through covid is, there's a lot of positives from that and in, in terms of how they're um, getting their arms around their own practice how they're talking to their teams uh, more bro broadly and they're looking after their staff and they're paying a much more attention on welfare and productivity um, at, at the same time. So those things are very positive, how they're using their technology. Where it's probably the jury's still out and there's some question marks is, well, what happens next? You know, and how, how did the firm get ready and anticipate the, yeah. the future? And depending on the firm, some have been stronger than that than others. But I'm sure we'll come on and talk more about we that, are. Rob, in, in a few we're minutes. We're going to hit that. Thank you. You bring up some excellent points. Gordon, you're talking to accountants every day. How do you feel they're coping with the change and disruption right now? Uh, overall, really well. Um, I think we're a little bit skewed at 2020 because they're the sort of firms that want to be more commercial in the first place and more open to changes. So maybe my view is a bit uh, skewed. Eight weeks ago, I think there was a a fear factor that most firms were thinking, oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? Mm. Um, and they probably overreacted, they over furloughed, uh, they over uh, cost cut. I know some firms just cut all costs and then if they were needed, they'd sort of try to bring them back. Um, one of the big four firms, for example, put a message out by video to the whole staff, you know, 35,000 ish in the UK. Eight weeks ago said don't you worry chaps uh, it's going to be fine <laughs> um, and the partners will be taking whatever hit there is they'll be taking the hit so you, you know, don't you worry uh, two or three weeks later the same chap came on a video say on reflection uh, <laughs> we think this is going to go rather better than we thought and we've decided we need to clear the way by for example uh, all unprofitable clients will be kicked into touch uh, so that we've got resources available for our more profitable clients. And then I think it was last week, I lose track of how time is actually flying. 
um, another video came up so actually chaps got that one wrong too um, we now know that we are going to be snowed under with uh, assisting and supporting our clients so much so here are the new rules on on holiday very specifically and it was well I'll tell you what it was and you can you can say whether you think it's draconian or not uh, if you've booked a holiday but you can't go to Spain and that has to be cancelled you can't cancel your holiday so that's that's that in the bag. If you get to 30th of June and you haven't taken 50% of your holiday allowance, tough shit. And you can't carry any forward. Here are the five days that you're going to have over Christmas and there is no carry forward into 2021. End of. Now, the reason, of course, is that they've recognized two things. One is it is a dynamic market. So what was best knowledge eight weeks ago is clearly not best knowledge today. We've learned an awful lot. I think Steve made the points, but we're on a very steep learning curve. Um, and they've gone from that position to, oh my goodness me, we are going to be absolutely snowed under with clients needing help. Now that has filtered, it's all the way down to the SME facing independent accounting firms. And I think from my own talkings with the managing partners and sole practitioners, if they have furloughed, they're all bringing either all of them or most of them back on stream because they, although they know they've lost a few clients or clients have gone quiet, those that are still in play are very active and are looking for a lot more support because I think it's fair to say the skills that accountants offer lend themselves almost perfectly to what, they, what clients need right now. So if you're in the UK and you're furloughing, mm. then dealing with the revenue, filling the forms in, or if you're wanting loans, oh. all of those skills are almost purpose-built for the skills of an accountancy firm oh. so touch wood certainly so far so good thank you kevin what are your thoughts on how accountants have dealt with this well it, it's it's the sixty-four thousand dollar question for me at the moment i mean since the since this crisis hit and even today one of the, the main challenges for me and for the team is to find out just how our firms are doing I mean, all sorts of reasons in terms of what firms need help how are we going to, to reshape our budget? And so we have any number of, of collaboration meetings at, at regional, sub-regional, we send out surveys. And so uh, no, no great revelations to add to either the, the two previous speakers, other than I think I'd say that, that I'm not surprised with the findings. The general terms, how firms have reacted is being dictated by the leadership, by the location, and to a great extent by the size of firms. So we've seen some incredible innovation uh, being displayed by firms and they, they do all the things we'd expect them to do in terms of looking after their clients, looking after their teams, being able to roll out and, and work very efficiently and effectively remotely within a very short period of time. Yeah. On the other hand, there are some of our firms, some of our smaller firms in some parts of the world, in Africa, Latin America, some parts of Asia and Eastern Europe, where I don't think I could say with the same degree of certainty that all is rosy. So it's, it's a mix. No question that, that, that overall the firms are reacting incredibly well. And I think the network plays a key part in being able to spread some of the best practice. Um, because you know all of our firms are led by capable people, uh, entrepreneurs who, who really have active uh, active professional skills uh, it's it's it, the jury is still out i think you know we're we're still in the process of of seeing how this is going to impact on latin america it hasn't impacted in the same way as it has in um, in, in the rest of the world at the moment on the other hand we're recovering in in asia that wasn't hit anything like as badly mm. so mixed I, i'd say we're comfortable at the moment we're not having to make any major changes to our, our budget pro projections uh, so so far so good but it's 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 a mixed picture i think in an, in an organization like with a mid-tier network where we have a complete spread of size of firms with our largest firm if it's over a billion dollars our smallest firm sole practitioners in latin america yeah. so it's 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 a difficult role yeah difficult one Steve, Kevin's touching there on some of the challenges already that firms are facing. What challenges are you seeing coming up and uh, what lessons will the good accounting firms will be learning from what's going on right now? 
Yeah, and I, and I totally think, uh, echo what Kevin said, that, that it is a varied picture uh, um, between both, even actually within countries and between countries. So I was talking to um, one of our Latin American firms yesterday, and their their, their business is now down to about 30% of what it was. You know, mm-hmm. you can imagine how severe change that is. You talk to the, the practice in the US, 5 to 10% down maybe, most of them. So it's not as, it's not as severe. Well, ca- cash flow revenue has been hit, obviously. Um, for some, for revenue for some has gone up, really. Um, yeah, but yeah. clearly, cash clearly cash is very different to revenue because they're more busier than they've all, always been, yeah. ever been really. So um, they're helping their clients more and charging for that work. The big one of the biggest challenges now is will they actually be paid for that work? And, and clearly, all of the firms, pretty universally, are very focused on on cash and cash flow management and managing some of their debt and in an understanding way. With their clients but clearly they need that um to um, um uh, continue and to survive again depending on the country uh some firms may have got government support and that they have to manage that and there are issues with getting that government support perception wise it has to have to be managed as well yeah. but, but for me the biggest biggest absolutely biggest challenge is the fact they have to deal with uncertainty so um with accountancy firms, I guess sometimes it's quite easy to get into a cycle of work where, you know, we have regular peaks and troughs and we know what we're doing and we're providing a service and we provide the service. None of that can be predicted now. So the firms have to sit there and think, okay, well, we're, we're anticipating and thinking ahead and thinking of serving these clients uh, in six months' time. Some of the clients may not be there. Some of them may require a totally different type of support and service than they've required in the past. So how do they get ready to that? Ready for that, and how do they make choose the right bets? Now, going to the point about okay, so what are some of the the lessons that are being learned? I think actually, to me, some of the lessons are literally that they have to start thinking in this way. You know, that the firms have to start thinking about one their own resilience and to their ability to change very rapidly. They've had to change rapidly in, a, in the course of um, a, few, a few weeks in terms of how they practice and operate. You, you see many of the firms now um, very quickly putting in new policies about flexible working because they realize that they're not going to go back to the same um, way of working as before and they know their staff won't want to and they can see some benefits of not going back in that way. Mm. So rapidly putting out policies um, to deal with that, which is good because they're, they're learning some lessons. And I think at this point about being able to step back, uh, look at look at the market, look at the insights, be more selective about who you're listening to. So um, the firms are making choices about out of our client base, you know, where do we want to really focus? Who, who will we listen to about future trends? What do we think will happen in terms of the upturn, upturn in different parts of the economy for our clients? And what does that mean for our decisions we have to make? And that means running a practice more like a business. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Gordon, you talked earlier about the, the challenges firms are having with vision and strategy and communicating what needs to be said right now. What challenges, apart from that, are you seeing and what lessons are they learning? Well, I think in terms of the lessons that uh, we're learning, the, the firms that have, in my experience anyway, the ones that seem to have done either fared quite well or very well, they, they are correlated. They seem to have most, if not all, their clients on the cloud already. Yeah. They have most, if not all, their clients paying a monthly subscription. Now, those two alone uh, make them much more resilient to firms that are billing annually, have massive work in progress that remains unbilled. There's going to be significant cash flow management issues. And, of course, talking to accountants, I don't need to explain that to them. Nonetheless, the, the weakest firms all seem to paint the same picture. Um, you mentioned leadership. Well, I think the leadership goes back before C19 ever showed up. Um, they always lack leadership, and, and these firms are muddling along because they probably could. It didn't really matter. They were making money when, you know, there was endless examples. One firm bought a sole practitioner, about 750000 making 300000 profit. So that's a very tidy, very tidy business indeed. And when he bought the business, it turned out that the sole practitioner's 12 staff, which is super efficient when you think that through, didn't even know that Excel spreadsheets added up. Hmm. I mean, I'm not joking, and that was only 18 months ago. So, of course, the question in that example is, how on earth did some business like that make so much money? And the answer was, of course, that the clients implicitly trusted 
the price that the individual put on the service. So he said, I've added up the timesheet, it's 2,000 pounds, and therefore it's 2,000 pounds. This guy was 70 years old. So he had built up this incredible trust, which of course our profession, everyone looks at our profession with green eyes as to why we've got so much trust. And so the firm that bought it then had to say, well, how do we unravel this? Do you, do you buy 750,000 fees and then immediately half the price in two because you're being massively efficient? Or do you try and manage that, which of course is what they've done, is they've introduced efficiencies and they've taken some super profits, but they have gradually reduced the price of their clients so as not to make the departing partner look a bit of a numpty. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important. I think someone mentioned the every country is different, and of course it's going to be different. In this country, particularly, the general consensus is that spring 91 is when we will see the downturn. This will be when most individuals, the, the 95% of our economy is sole practitioners and small self-employed people, their tax bills that are delayed July, carried forward to January, may or may not be being paid in January. They've then got business bounce, bounce back loans or business interruption loans. All of those will be coming home to roost. So if the revenue take a strong stance on payments, that's going to be a major problem. We hope that they won't. But the, the guys who know what they're talking about are saying, if it's going to be a big problem, it'll come spring, early part of, of, of next year. Yeah. Okay. Prepping for the opportunities, well, you know, Digital everything is going to be where it's well, for some firms it already is there, but if it's not, they won't be able to they won't be able to compete because uh, working from home and the, the hybrid of working from home and going back to the office. Well, who's going to go back? Who's going to have to self isolate as we emerge and then we go back and we emerge? There's a very fluid market there. The client propositions all going to be digital, with always there's exceptions to all rules. Um, and therefore, we're going to have to focus on productivity or more specifically workflow using technology, which, again, all of those items were on our to-do list. It's just that they weren't being rushed through. They were coming through at, at, at our own pace. But now most people, I, one particular guy, lovely gentleman, 60 years old, eight weeks ago, I could hear the voice rounding in my ears. We were talking about working from home and that sort of thing. And. He said, oh, well, my dead body, Gordon, are people going to be working from home in my firm? And he had about 60 people in his practice. Anyway, spoke to him two weeks ago. He said, this working from home stuff, not so <laughs> bad, is it? Yeah. So once he was forced to do it, 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 it you know, your imagination runs away with this, like outsourcing or offshoring to India or the Philippines or such. Like a lot of people get their knickers in a twist about it. But actually, once you get your head around it, it's a tremendous resource sure. that more firms are using today than they did yesterday. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Kevin, there's a lot of points coming up here. What yeah. well, challenges the, are you seeing and what lessons have been learned? Well, the problem is being third, you see. I listen to what Steve and Gordon <laughs> saying. I tick them off. But actually, I, I, I think it, that to it. You won't be there next time after that comment. Yeah, no, no, but that call to everything they've said. But for me, I think the biggest challenge is encapsulated in one word, and that's leadership. Mm. I, I think that, that our leaders are being challenged in a way that, that they've never been challenged before. Yeah, yeah. And also, to be honest, in, in, in many instances, they're not necessarily equipped in terms of having been trained or, or having experience in this before. I mean, you, you, you think of the challenges they've got. And, and whatever, that, whatever the discussion point is, is a challenge. It, it's managing the, 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 the finances, the clients, getting in their money. It's managing their staff. I mean, the, the challenge of, of, of managing staff remotely is, is, is new for us all. It's mm. incredibly complicated. You know, the, the stresses that, that that brings on people, there's a whole range of it. And the longer this goes on, the worse it becomes. Now, you know, working remotely under normal circumstances is no problem. But when you're working from home, when you're locked down, where you have no other means of, 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 of of meeting people, social interacting with the people, it, it, it is already, we're finding around the network, that it, it is causing big challenges for a lot of people. Yeah. But the whole style of leadership is being challenged. You know, you look at the, the component parts of leadership, communication, they have to delegate. For, for some guys, the very first time ever, they have to assume that their managers, that because most of the most of the firms working little units within their, their their departments, they have to assume and trust that their managers will manage and 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 
trust uh, and, and uh, operate efficiently. So I, I think um, and you add to that the mix of trying to predict where they need to be, what does the new normal mean? I don't think our firms, our leaders have ever been challenged in a way that they, they are at the moment. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's again, it'll, it'll cause some difficulty for, for many firms, I think. Well, let's stay with leadership for a moment. I'm intrigued about the way you feel accounting firms have been led. Presumably, Kevin, from your army days, you would plan for all and train for all kinds of situations, but accountants could never have predicted something like this, could they? No, of course not. And, and, and you know, the one, I'm not. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination being critical. Um, but I think the the one point I, I'd make, I, I, I don't draw too many direct comparisons. But but it's the it's the preparation and training that I think sometimes the, it doesn't always happen in 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 accounting firms. And in a military context, you you actively prepare and you train for 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 all. Con- you can't. You can never anticipate every single contingency, yeah. and there's a, it's a, a recognised fact that whatever plan you make will never survive the first uh, first amount of, of, of pressure or, or contact, as it were. Yeah. Um, but and and the but the challenges in in general terms are the same. It, it's it's the communication. It's bringing your team with you. It's it's having the capacity to to anticipate and make some sensible decisions and and make make sure they're implemented. Yeah. Um, God, and you've been leading in this profession for a long time. It, it was a quote from Mike Tyson, the boxer, that said, anyone can have a great plan or strategy until they're hit really hard in the face. And yeah. Uh, yeah. accountants have been hit really hard in the face. How do you feel the firms have been led throughout this? Uh, well, again, um, a mixed bag, I would say. But um, Some firms have been exposed, haven't they, in terms of leadership? Let's be very honest. much. Yeah. Um, actually, again, one has to reflect of some managing partners that have done incredibly well and some that are floundering. And it seems to me by observation, the ones that do best, not just up to, but especially now, are those that I would say with a pinch of salt are benevolent dictators. You know, somehow the structure of the firm allows the, the leader to be a benevolent dictator. Whereas some firms, of course, they have a, partners meeting for everything and everyone wants to talk about where the Christmas lunch is going to be uh, and you just get nowhere fast Mm. so uh, picking up on I think an excellent point from Kevin about the leadership that one the leaders this is the time when the leaders absolutely need to step up if they haven't got a position of of benevolent dictatorship that would be their first challenge to say I need to get in a position where somebody needs to be able to say it's going you know follow me chap this is the way we're going um, and some of the partners that would otherwise say, well, hang on a minute, let's have another discussion and let's put a paper together and let's look at the risk and the rewards and put it on a spreadsheet and let's take our time. We don't want to rush into any decisions. <laughs> yeah. Th- those people have got no place right now. No. And it, it may well be the wrong decision that a benevolent dictator takes, but that's not my experience. My experience is we're going this path, chaps and ladies, let's go, let's go. And I think around this table and around most tables, we know the general direction where we should be going. It's whether or not we can communicate clearly to the team. We are going digital, guys. We are focusing on C19 because that's what our clients want. But it's all consuming right now, so get your head around it. Some of us will be applying our minds to tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to have a higher tax regime much higher. Uh, Tomorrow we're gonna have international tax discussion. So do we set up in Ireland for Europe? Do we stay in the UK? What's gonna happen? Are we versatile? You guys with your international associations are so well placed to be able to take care of that huge issue because all these governments are spending a small fortune supporting their own economies and the global economy. It's all gonna have to be paid for by the next generation. Mm. So I, I suspect retooling and retraining our team brackets digitally will be a massive area for tomorrow yeah we, we might talk some more about the challenges later but steve this is not a time for dithering leadership it's not even the time for leadership by consensus because you can't get the opinions of everyone you've just got to as gordon said pick a direction and go haven't you i think it's right you have to we have you have to make the right decisions but i think um 
and I think this is still in line with what you were saying, Gordon, it, it's making the decision with the right, the best information you can get and the, with the judgments of people that you um, uh, do trust. And the, the firms that you see uh, working away through this, uh, I think most effectively, they will have leaders who understand what decisions are required. And some of that could be immediate decisions around um, staffing, keeping interns, what to do about, you know, do you actually, are you going to put people back in an office space soon or not? Um, they, they understand um, some of the more immediate decisions, but they also think are thinking about the future and, 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 and anticipating what could be required and what, where they'll have to focus their attention. And they bring that to um, effectively a management team, really. That's how, how, the, how the, the best firms are, are, are being managed. And they listen and they hear the different views and then they make sure a call is made. You know, what, what's a non-essential service? Where, where, where do you start to withdraw uh, resources? But you have to think about the impact in the future. So there is a danger of if you try and make those decisions too quickly. And I think, Gordon, you were describing um, a good example of where decisions may be made too rapidly because there wasn't adequate discussion with the team. So some of the firms I, I talked to, they're going back and saying, OK, well, let's let's think what happened back in 2009. Mm. What did we learn after the financial crisis? And a lot of them say, well, what we learned, we let people go too quickly. And that, that had an impact on those practices probably two years later. So now they're stepping back and saying, well, we know that. We know the work is going to come back, maybe in a different form. We don't want to be in a market where we don't have the right capability. So let's make the decisions where we keep these key people. And perhaps we take cost reductions elsewhere. And you've seen very strong leadership where you see the partners saying, well, we'll step back and we'll, t we'll take um, uh, a reduction you know, in what, what they're withdrawing. You know? And you see partners now taking 35% reductions you know and we could say okay partners get paid well well they, they do and they don't depends on the size of the size of practice you know um, but that is for anyone that is a big change in lifestyle as you happen to take a 35 percent uh, reduction in your income so i think the key is yes know the decisions that need to be made yes take them quickly but put together a trusted team to help you do that yeah. And, and briefly, before we move on, we've got a couple more questions, but has this changed, and this is for anyone here that wants to come in, has this changed the way firms will be led going forward? Or has it, as Gordon was hinting, just accelerated some of the processes and cultures that were already in place? I think I think it will it will improve things. I mean, you know, we all learn from experience, and those firms that uh, learn most quickly and, and are successful will 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 cement in some of the, the, uh, the, the practices they follow. So I, I think it will, it will improve leadership. Uh, there, there's no question about that. And just to, to correct, in case I, I gave the wrong impression, I mean, uh, I, we've all seen some outstanding examples of leadership. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we try and do within the network is to share uh, this, this best practice. And the, the most successful firms tend to be those who are actually quite consultative, I mean, from my experience, that, that when you make decisions in, in very stressful circumstances, you need buy-in. and you, you, you do that by, by, by a lot of communication and persuasion. Um, and so there's, a, there's been huge improvements in communication and uh, building consensus. I think that's very key. Yeah. I mean, Rob, I'll just add on the, um, will it change the way firms run? I think it will because... Um, I'm sure, Kevin, you see this as well, but in the way that the U.S. firms, uh, some of our U.S. firms are run, they've moved to a model of having uh, sort of chief operating officers, managing partners who are freed up to actually run the practice much, much quicker than, say, in the U.K., where that's still less common. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what, what the practices in the U.K. are now learning is you really can't run a practice just by a collective view of partners who particular no. they have particular specialisms in different areas. So I think, I think it will change in the U.K. the way the practices are run as well. Yeah. Um, well, I, of course, agree with everything. There is an assumption there that the firm has enough critical mass to support that sort of management structure. So, yeah. Um, if you're too small to warrant a managing partner, then clearly needs must. Um, the smaller the firm, of course, the more nimble uh, it probably is. So they can turn on the tuppence if they need to. They can send people home. They can deal with, that was very silly, but you know, the first real problem was uh, people having sore backs working from home. That was the first real problem that people just didn't see coming. And so we then had a surge of office chairs 
some firms had all in place and sorted it. Other firms seemed to make a pig's ear out of it. Just a simple, let's get an office chair to your home. You would have thought that would have been a fairly innocuous exercise, but no, for some firms that was very problematic. Great. Well, we talked about leadership, gents. I want to talk quickly about clients. Have they been put first in all of this? Uh, have they been perhaps promised proactivity and that's not quite been the case? Stephen, what has this taught us about the way firms have been putting or should have been putting clients first? Yeah, um, I think I think what it has um, taught, taught us is it's really, really important to, one, one have the communication with clients so um, we remain, uh, the firms remain to have uh, that trust to advisor status. And that means knowing actually, you know, keeping the personal contact, having the social conversations, which is actually more difficult in the virtual world, but, it, mm. but it's essential to build trust. And then really understanding the pain points for those clients and being able to um, um, provide uh, value that um, will, su will support them. So that's basically going back to the messages that we have been talking about in the profession for many years about being very advisory and consultant and consultative that doesn't necessarily mean we all move into consulting businesses and our firms all move into consulting businesses but that skill and that mindset is going to be essential um, go, going forward so listen, listening to the needs and then trying to think okay what's the right solutions and trying to anticipate that I think is going to be essential for the future yeah sure Gordon have firms been putting clients first uh, yes absolutely they have maybe under duress but they have it's the way we've been brought up. Uh, I was uh, chatting with a guy called Ainsley Damery from a company called Clarity HQ, very good business advisory software. On, in fact, it's on blockchain. Uh, but it's brilliant. And, and he was making the observation, uh, being an ex-accountant, sold his practice, so he knows his, he knows his stuff. He would have 150 clients as a partner back in the day. And he said, just say I spoke to managed to get... 50, having a meaningful chat with 50 clients, that would typically be about three hours conversation. Uh, you do the sums, that's 150 hours. Well, that is a one fully chargeable month. And you wonder why they're feeling under the cosh. I mean, it's because the clients are saying, help, help, what do I do? What do I do? I don't know what to do. And luckily, fortunately, accountants are one, calm, naturally, and two, have the skills to interpret what's going on. So we know what a cash flow, what it means. We actually know that in six months time, you're gonna have a problem. In three months time, you're gonna have a problem. These yeah. are things you've got to do. We understand that thing. So yes, we have been client led. Some firms have then, as we mentioned just a few minutes ago, have also focused on team loyalty uh, because they understand that although it went from an employee's market, literally yesterday to an employer's market as we speak right now, it is already flipping around. It's going to go back. We're going to have very short memories. It's going to flip back to an employee's market because people like accountants will be sought after animals. Tax people will be gold dust uh, in the next few months or years uh, in terms of the client proposition. The new norm, uh, well, I think... Well, we'll come to the new normal in a minute, Gordon, if you don't mind, if, if that's sure, okay. Absolutely. But let's just take Kevin upon clients and then I'm going to ask you with your final thoughts for what the rest of 2020 might look like in terms of any new normal. But Kevin, from you, have we been putting clients first? Oh, yes. I, I think uh, from my experience, uh, certainly talking to our firms, the, the natural inclination, frankly, is to put the clients first. And, mm -hmm. and, and firm, the partners and firms have have done that quite naturally normally. Of course, there's a, there's a, there's a degree of self-interest because it's really key to them to retain their clients. That, that is for sure. Um, so I don't think there's any question about that. In terms of the new normal, we, we were just chatting about this earlier on. I think it depends absolutely on how this, this crisis unfolds because if, if miraculously they would find a, a, a cure or a vaccine tomorrow, then then the new normal may be different to that which it may be if this went on for another another six months, nine months. And of course, that brings that brings the challenge to, to firms in terms of when they decide what the new normal is and when they decide what steps they need to take for this imagined new normal. Yeah. And there's a danger, I suppose, of, of, of taking decisions that may in hindsight appear to be premature. And it's the, it's the judgment call as to using what time you have to make the decisions you need to. So it's, it's very difficult. I, I think I, I agree with the comment I think that was made earlier on by Gordon that 
I think firms will will experience more of a, a more difficulty in getting uh, their their fees in from clients in 2021, spring of 2021, than they have done to date. Uh, so that will be an immediate challenge they have to to face. But I think in general terms, it it depends entirely upon how long this 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 goes on. I mean, there's some obvious there's some obvious questions that they will need to address relatively short term. I mean remote working, there will be a lot of discussion. There already is a lot of discussion about the balance between working remotely and an office. Do we need to be in an office? If so, what sort of an office? How long? So there are a lot of, lot of discussion to be have, had on, on relatively operational type stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, that this crisis has, has provided a catalyst for many firms to have taken decisions that they were planning to make anyway and we could talk about that separately but you know underperforming people perhaps they've been excused maybe to to make some movement in that direction but i think generally it it depends entirely upon how the next three or four months unfolds yeah sure stephen final thoughts from you on what the rest of 2020 looks like for the accounting world mm. And I think I'd echo uh, whatever as said, as Kevin has said as well, that, that we don't know quite what will happen, but the key thing is uh, for the accountancy world is to be ready for that. And that, that does mean a really hard look at, um, do we have the right tools in the toolbox? So for the firms, I think they, they, there is a degree of now retooling and, and that comes in different ways. You know, are, are, are they fully digital? Are they, digital is not just for the sake of being digital. Digital is actually a way to understand what's going on in the market better and to understand clients better and therefore make quicker decisions. So are, do, they, are they, do they have the, the technology to do that? And then secondly, do they have the people to do that, which is probably more important actually than mm. the technology. So there's also the retooling of making sure that um, the, the partners and the teams have that ability to um, uh, listen, to show empathy, and importantly, to lead um, as well in the future and be able to change and deal with change very, very rapidly. And I think the firms which can equip themselves in, in that way, whatever happens in these scenarios, they're going to do well. Yeah, very good. Thank you. God, and final thoughts from you on what next for the remainder of 2020 for accountants and the firms they serve quickly? Oh, well, uh, first of all, I want to support everything that's been said because we can't, but I'm going to reinforce the, the dyna, the dyna, I can't get my words out, easy for me to say, the changing market, we'll go with that. It's very dynamic. And so therefore, if you can delay a decision such as an office, re, you know, an office refurbishment, then please do. Yeah. Uh, I utterly agree that in any case, we're going to go digital. So that's in the bag. So you can be fairly firm on that and say, well, how do we communicate with our team? How do we, the, the big outstanding is training, supervision, training. That is unknown territory. No one's got their head around it yet to my knowledge, but it's the big one because if we can't bring the youngsters through in the, in the profession and bring them on, the blood flow will stop. And that of course is unthinkable. We've got to have, trainees coming in, training them up, supervising them, but no firm to my knowledge has yet cracked. How do we supervise efficiently and effectively remotely? It's yeah. a big story that is outstanding. The, the service lines, I think the virtual financial officer is the fastest growing solution the accounting profession will offer. So we'll do the bookkeeping, we'll do the payroll, we'll get trainees doing that, we'll get seniors and their managers doing monthly management accounts and quarterlies and then the partners will come in and do a quarterly review and interpretation for less than it's costing my business to hire a bookkeeper internally wow. okay. so, so i will get a much better solution by outsourcing my accounting function to my accountant than i ever did do in the old days of having my own bookkeeper because they only have one level of skill most of which is under their skill base and therefore they're bored and they make mistakes and then some of it's over their skill base uh, so yep. they can't do the financial director's role. Got so it, I man. think the future's looking good, but we need to be flexible. Sure. Got to wrap things up now. Any final thoughts from you, Kevin, on what's coming up? Oh, you're on mute. Let's just give you the last word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that probably sums up sums it all up, the digital challenge, I think, isn't it? Speaking <laughs> on mute. 
but I, I think it's uh, I, I think we've said all that that can be said about this. It's uh, it's a really challenging time for for firms. But I, I you know whatever else about the accounting profession, it has learned to adapt over the years, and it will adapt. There's no question about that. Yeah. Um, and some firms will just adapt more quickly than others. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your insights, being collaborative, being inspiring. The message here is optimistic. We are in challenging times, but uh, accountants are in a very uh, treasured position of being able to make a real difference. So thanks for joining us. I'm sure you've got another Zoom call in just a few minutes because that's the way things are going right now. But, but hopefully we can have you on another panel going forward. Enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for your thoughts today. Good to see you all. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.